Well, let me welcome uh, all of my Duke colleagues uh, and, uh, and a number of our outside guests that are uh, enjoying this panel today. This is our second discussion on racial equality and part of our company's uh, efforts to heighten awareness and support change in all the communities that we live and work in today. It's my pleasure to introduce three very good friends of mine. I've gotten to know all three of these individuals through the business world, and I have tremendous respect for their professional accomplishments uh, and their support of diversity efforts across the country, as well as their contributions to Duke Realty. They're all here today as friends of the company, and they are supportive of our mission to be a leader in diversity inclusion. I have asked each of them to be completely honest and direct with us in their assessment. We can't get better as individuals and an organization if we can't accept strong criticism and direct feedback. So now, without further ado, let me introduce them. Colette English Dixon. Colette is the executive director of the Marshall Bennett Institute of Real Estate at Roosevelt University. Prior to joining Roosevelt, uh, Colette spent over 30 years in the commercial real estate industry with various business units of Prudential Financial. Colette is also a member of the board of directors for the Housing Partnership Equity Trust. Broadstone Real Estate Access Fund, and the International Women's Forum. She is also a past president of the Crew Network and the past chair of the Crew Network Foundation. So welcome, Colette. Thank you, Jim. Norm, Norman K. Jenkins. Norm is the president of Capstone Development, a firm he founded in 2009. Capstone acquires and develops hospitality real estate around the country, currently owns a portfolio of hotels in, in, uh, in valued in excess of $2.5 billion dollars. Norm started his career at McDonald's and then joined Marriott, where he worked for 16 years, culminating as the Senior Vice President, North American Lodging Development. Norm is a current member of the Duke Realty Board of Directors, as well as in the Board of Trustees of Suburban Hospital. Last year, Norm was recognized as the inaugural recipient of the Diversity Inclusion Award by Lodging Magazine. Welcome, Norm. Thank you. Last but not least, Thomas J. Baltimore, Jr., Tom is the chairman of the board, president and CEO of Park Hotels and Resorts. Traded on the New York Stock Exchange, Park is one of the largest lodging REITs with 54 major hotels around the world, encompassing 32,000 rooms. Prior to Park's IPO, Tom was the founder and CEO of RLJ Lodging, another publicly traded real estate lodging trust. Prior to joining RLJ, Tom spent time with both Hilton and Marriott. Tom serves on the board of directors of Prudential and Auto Nation, and is the past chair of the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, as well as a former member of the Duke Realty Board of Directors. Welcome, Tom. So on behalf of all of our associates, let me welcome the three of you and thank you for taking the time to share your perspectives with us today. I'll jump right in with our first question. Duke Realty has long been recognized as a leader for its diversity and inclusion efforts in the commercial real estate industry. Given all that is happening in the country today and Duke's desire to be a leader in diversity and inclusion beyond just the commercial real estate industry, what should we as a company be focused on? And Colette, let's start with you. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, I really believe that Duke has you know, created an incredible brand in the industry around its efforts in DNI. The opportunity these days to expand the footprint outside of the industry allows you to say, you want to engage in initiatives that support economic development in cities, um, partnering with local organizations to help develop black and brown business leaders, um, to engage in educational um, equity. Uh, there are a lot of different values that your company has and a lot of experience that you have that I actually think you can take that and deploy it on the ground in so many different aspects of just everyday life outside of this industry that will help actually advance your brand as being truly committed to DNI across the board. Great, thank you, Norm. How about your perspectives? Uh, you know, I, I think Duke is a is a great company, and 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 you know, successful diversity initiatives start from the top. And uh, Jim, you, you've been a, a thought leader on diversity and, and recognized in the industry for that. Uh, you, you, you've done a tremendous job in diversifying our board. Uh, we have very talented people of color and, and, and women on the board. Uh, our board has recently uh, adopted a, a board policy on, on diversity. Um, and I'm proud to say that 
you know, a few months ago, you arranged a call with uh, several of our, our African American associates, and and they shared their stories. And I'm sure the stories weren't easy to share, but Duke has an environment and a culture that that you've helped to, to cultivate that allowed. And I, I want to make sure I mention their names. It was uh, Dave Jarvis and Janine and Natalie Tyler Martin and Sandra Gilbert did a, tr a tremendous job in telling their, their life stories and their their respective journeys. But you actually created an environment that made those stories. To, uh, uh, they could tell those stories in a very comfortable way and uh, among colleagues that they didn't know well. And, and, and that's that's what diversity is all about, creating an environment where everyone feels comfortable and welcomed. Thanks, Norm. Tom, your perspectives? Yeah, I, I would certainly, Jim. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you and your leadership team for uh, certainly putting on this panel today. Um, I'm honored to serve with both uh, Colette and Norm, um, two extraordinarily talented executives who I've known for a long time and and, uh, and watched their careers. Um, I have immense respect for you, Jim, and your team, the board, and uh, and I was thrilled to have the opportunity to serve on the Duke board for eight, eight to nine years. Uh, I miss the board. Um, I know that you've upgraded, and, um, and there's no opportunity for me in the future, but I, I certainly <laughs> understand that. Um, I, so I would take you back. Yeah. I, I I really echo the comments made by both Khaled and Norm. Um, I, I would emphasize again the tone at the top and leadership. Um, you, you you mean it. Um, you hold people accountable, and I think this is an example of that. I also think what you're doing in the industry and the broader NAREIT uh, community, being on the executive board, uh, also going to serve on the DNI Council there, which I know hasn't been publicly disclosed, but I know will be in the in the near future. Uh, in addition to a recipient of the, the inaugural award last year by NARI. So I think continuing those efforts, um, tone at the top, leadership are critically important uh, on the subject matter. Uh, as you think about other things, a lot of companies have sort of broken their, their, their initiatives into sort of people um, kind of business and how they target um, on the people side, obviously recruiting efforts and internships and mentoring. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into all of that. On the business front, how they tailor products and services, and then I think on the on the societal, there are a lot of different ways, as Colette outlined, that that Duke can support, whether it's education, uh, whether it's police reform, um, being the leader, and the leaders that you have spread out across the Duke platform in those various cities are are terribly important as well. So I'll, I'll stop there. Well, thank you all for your kind words. Um, let me let me shift to a topic that Tom just touched on, which is the recruiting topic. So, um, you know, as we seek to hire more diverse associates all over the country, we often hear, you know, we can't find any qualified or experienced diverse or women candidates. Um, we have a what we call a VIP or value in people, effectively the Rooney Rule that has been in place for eight years, and that's helped. But I would tell you we haven't been able to achieve the success that we would like to. Um, give us some things to think about in terms of how we might change our search, recruiting, and on our hiring success for diverse associates around the country. So, nor, or, uh, Tom, why don't we let you stop, uh, start off? You know, Jim, this is a, a terribly important topic and one that's near and dear to my heart, and I know my colleagues on the panel as well. Um, and, and I think you, you set the, the groundwork that we should be honest and and really transparent about this subject matter. I think this is probably one of the more sensitive areas. Uh, people always, I, I hear it often, I've heard it throughout my career. You know, I'd really like to hire someone of color, but I just can't find someone with that skill set. Um, I, I would respectfully submit that that um, that's not an acceptable answer. Um, that I think there are many qualified men and women of color. Uh, I think it's important that you have to widen the funnel. So I think. Um, Recruiting um, internships are, are terribly important. Uh, there are a couple of organizations. Obviously, the Robert Twigo Foundation is one that a lot of firms on Wall Street, and particularly looking for finance roles and development roles. These are uh, the Robert uh, Twigo Foundation. Uh, they're Twigo Fellows. So these uh, they set up a program that really trains um, students of color, African American, Latino, and, uh, and Asian. Uh, and through that, they then get them internships on Wall Street and other development and private equity firms. 
And then many of them are then subsequently placed in firms around the country. I mean, that's been a, a huge portal and pipeline for certainly developing talent. Um, and I, my former role at uh, both at RLJ and at Park have, have worked with Trigo Fellows many times, and they are extraordinarily talented, many coming from Ivy League schools and certainly have the, the, they've got the wherewithal, the foundation to be successful. But I also think as you're recruiting people, you've got to support people and you've got to provide the systems. Uh, it's also, I think, easier to sometimes recruit um, at companies where they see people of color uh, and women that are in senior roles, whether that's in the C-suite. Uh, people then, it's easier to recruit because people see there's a role model. Um, they see this extraordinary woman that's there and she serves as a role model. She helps to, to recruit and uh, it's amazing the incremental benefits that you certainly get from that. So I'll stop there. I know my colleagues will have other incremental comments, but I'm, I'm a big believer in widening that funnel in that pipeline and that distribution network. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Norm, your perspectives? Yeah, I, I would agree with Tom, uh, everything you said. Uh, you have to think in terms of where are you looking for people. Uh, if you're looking in the exact same places that you've always looked, you're going to yield the same results. So uh, whether or not you're using different executive recruiters that may specialize in uh, diversity, there are a number of uh, top-rate firms that you can you can target. Uh, if you're looking at uh, organizations, uh, organizations like the Executive Leadership Council, the, the Real Estate Executive Council, uh, populated with a number of senior uh, African American uh, executives uh, that can be recruited, and, and we need to we, we need to think in terms of recruiting people that are outside of of, of the industry. And, and train them to 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 work in uh, within the logistics area. In terms of schools, I think that you should widen the net and, and begin recruiting at, at HBCUs. They have a wonderful talent at those schools, and all the top flight uh, banking firms and accounting firms and engineering firms are all flocking to HBCUs. And there's uh, no rise, reason why we shouldn't do that at Duke. Uh, the other thing that I, that I that I ask you to consider as well is look inside the organization. Uh, you have some talent within Duke, and there's some talent that can be cultivated. Uh, if I think about my success and Tom and Colin will be, say the same thing, is uh, a, yes, we had to work hard and improve ourselves, but we had great coaching, which turned into mentoring, which ultimately turned into sponsorship. Uh, we, we had some men and women who looked after us and gave us a nudge here or there. So there may be talent within Duke, and I'm confident there's talent within Duke that, that can be coached and mentored, and, and, and perhaps those are our next stars. Uh, one thing I talk about, when people are thinking in terms of, of diversity recruiting, they, they typically want to sort of focus on the entry level, and I think we have to focus on the entry level, middle management, and senior management, and we, we need to think in terms of plucking people from other industries so to Tom's point, those, those new folks that you're bringing in at the lower levels can see somebody who looks like them, they can connect with, and the likelihood of, of keeping them for a long, long time has increased significantly. Well, thanks, Norm. Colette, I saved you for last, um, primarily because um, you are at an institution that Duke Realty believes uh, deeply in uh, and has partnered with. But I'd, I'd like you to share with everybody your perspectives now that you have left um, Prudential and the uh, and the world of capitalists, and you are now an educator. Well, um, it's hard to follow up behind Tom and Norm. Um, There's a lot of the things that I probably would have said at the top of my comments, they already covered. But the Institute, the Marshall Bennett Institute of Real Estate, really, really appreciates the partnership that we've created with Duke. And the reason why I believe it is a an example, a template for what you may want to consider doing with HBCUs or other schools that have more diverse student populations is that it allows you to build an awareness of who you are. I mean, one of the challenges that this industry has as this industry as a whole is that many black and brown people have no idea what this industry is about. They don't see it. They don't touch it, they don't experience it. And so the idea of like, what's the, what's the potential? What's the opportunity? Why would I want to actually even think about joining a firm that works in commercial real estate? And then, oh, by the way, you guys are industrial, which means they don't even see you. At least 
you know, office building firms can say, you saw that building downtown? Well, that's us. <laughs> when you're when you're an industrial, it's like, I'm sorry, what is what do I do? What is that? How does that work? Why do I want to be there? Yeah. So engaging directly and intentionally with platforms that allow you to expand awareness of what you do and who you are in places that have diverse candidates, young people looking to figure out what they want to do. And they may be accounting majors for all we know. We all know real estate's not rocket science. So it isn't like you have to have some, you know, incredibly um, intricate degree in order to be successful here. Uh, many people are you know, basically do well here as art history majors. I mean, it's, it's an industry you can learn as long as you understand what you're getting into, as long as you have the support to train you and to mentor you and to cultivate that interest. So I think with us and with other schools similar to ours that have diverse student populations, Duke can make a huge difference in that entry level talent. And I would encourage you to look at ways that partnering with other programs like ours can actually add to that pool. But I totally, I totally echo the thought that hiring has got to be at all levels. Engagement for diverse talent has to be at all levels. And also looking outside the industry with people with skill sets and experiences that would transfer well into the Duke culture and the Duke business model could be another great way to identify diverse talent for your organization. Thanks, Colette. I have a follow-up question to my last question, um, and I'm going to put you all on the spot. If your son or daughter was being recruited to join Duke Realty, what grade would you give us, and what advice would you give your son or daughter? So I'm going to shift it up, and I'm going to let Norm go first. Oh, well, thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my son just graduated from college in, in – uh, this past May, and he, and he wasn't recruited by Duke, but uh, uh, he was recruited by a banking firm. Um, yeah, I, I would, I'd actually give Duke an A, and, 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 and I don't, I don't consider myself an easy grader, but um, you know, the A grade is is not because of our existing statistics, because I still believe we have uh, some areas of opportunity for improvement, uh, but you know. Successful diversity initiatives start with a strong commitment from the top. And Jim, you've exhibited that for a number of years. Uh, you, you, we're, we're holding, you know, our, our, our management team uh, accountable. We're establishing, you know, meaningful goals. Uh, we discuss diversity intently at, at every single board meeting. So I, I think that all of the building blocks are in place for uh, significant success. We're not there, success is a journey. But uh, I, I, I'd give us an A and, and, and uh, I'd tell my son or daughter to, to go in, uh, you know, uh, work hard, uh, build and establish relationships. Uh, part of your job is what you do during the day. Part of your job is what you do in lunch hour and after work and building relationships and, and, and networking and, and, and learning more outside of, of the job. I, I think about you know, the course of my career and uh, yeah, the work was the work, but those those lunches and after work uh, beverages that I had and I was able to learn so much about the organization and about people and about how to better position myself for success. So uh, th those are the keys I, I share with my kids and, and do share with my kids today. Okay, Tom, I know you have a son and a daughter. What's your grade? What would you tell them? Um, I, I would echo Norm's comment. I would I would echo the A, and uh, I too am not an easy grader, Jim. But I think again, tone at the top. Uh, that's not only you as the chairman and CEO, but your senior management team, your board. Um, the commitment is real. So I think that's first and foremost. So I'd I'd welcome the opportunity. My daughter's a first year in in college, and my son's a junior, um, and he does need a summer internship next year. <laughs> <laughs> and a job because right now he's taking his classes remotely and uh, um, in school part of the time and playing golf and he's playing really good golf right now so that's a problem for me. Oh great, we're going to bring him to India. I need all the help I can get. Yeah, but I I, I think um, you know Jim, all the things that we've talked about, um, I, I would tell him uh, to uh, embrace the opportunity, learn, uh, be the sponge build your toolkit, 
um, watch the practices, watch the leadership style. Um, I know you, I know Mark, I, I know Nick, I know other members of the team. So there's so much that, that he could learn in that opportunity. Um, so I, I, I think you've got the right foundation and you've got a business model that's proven, um, that's got a phenomenal track record and it's gonna be a growth vehicle for many years to come. So. Great, Colette? Oh my, um, grading things is always a little hard, and I am, You're I'm usually, academia now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely not my strength here, um, but I guess I would give Duke an A minus, maybe a B plus. Um, I think that there are aspects of what the organization is doing around talent development and organizational um, commitment to DNI and everything else it wants to do well. I can't argue that, and it does all start with you, Jim, and is the tone at the top is incredibly important. But there's a lot of work to do. And I think that um, with the need to further improve the parity of uh, presence of people of color and women throughout all levels of the company, that is the opportunity that to me keeps the firm from getting the clean grade. Um, and because I believe that there are challenges to this and it's got to be the long-term commitment. This is the long game. And you can't, you can't um, expect that um, you know, the commitment at the top is going to be absorbed by everybody all the time, but that diligence and that uh, persistence that this is who you are and this is what's important to your firm and that it will wind up paying off in, in spades across the board is where I see the growth to go from the A minus B plus to the pure A. And if I had a daughter, I do have a daughter, actually she's 27. Real estate is the one part of this world she does not want to be a part of, and I can't, that's another conversation. But I would say if there was an opportunity at Duke, um, all of the importance of engaging with your colleagues, building the relationships, absorbing every bit of knowledge that you can, and being a part of the collaborative team effort to be excellent, um, excellent performers for your industry and for your clients and your stakeholders and being in the midst of everything that you can is really, really key. Also, the idea of identifying a mentor and relationships that can help guide you through the organization to avoid some of those pitfalls and be open to constructive performance review, uh, constructive advice to how to do better, be better, um, are all keys to being really successful in any company. And I think that Duke's intent to support and develop talent would work well with that sort of, you know, talent perspective coming in the door. All right, so let's assume Duke Realty makes the types of changes we've just discussed. Um, what should we consider doing to enhance the culture and the environment within the company and our offices to make minorities feel more comfortable joining and staying and growing at Duke Realty. Who do you want to go first? So, oh, I have to pick um, Norman. I can. Your face is on my screen, so you go sure. first. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that uh, uh, ongoing dialogue is 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 probably most important. Um, you, you know, when you think in terms of of diversity. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's it's diversity for the whole company. It's not we're not talking about you know a group of individuals and creating programs that benefit a group of individuals. Uh, it has to be driven home that diverse companies simply perform better. It's been shown over and over again that that companies that that are more diverse have better ideas, uh, cutting edge ideas. They they perform better. They have uh, better relationships and, and team building. So I, I think that ensuring that we continue to have uh, dialogue. And, and, and when, when I saw this, this question earlier, I, I was thinking about a conversation I was having with a couple of friends, uh, chief executives who were not diverse, and, and we were talking about the issue of diversity. And they said one of the, the, the most important uh, points about diversity that they have to convey is that A, diversity, is, is just like any other business imperative, it's gonna, it's gonna make us better. But in addition to that, diversity 
is not and should not be viewed as a zero sum game. If we're hiring people of color or if we're hiring X number of women, it's not at the expense of someone else. Uh, diversity is designed to, to, to mean that, you know, one plus one equals five. So uh, we just have to be mindful of driving that those points home. And, and I think our, our culture will continue to, uh, uh, to be enhanced. Yeah, I think that's a good point in the current environment, especially it's, it doesn't mean um, somebody else loses. Right. So. Tom, do you want to answer next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, Norm hit the nail on the head. I would uh, agree with all the comments. Uh, I do think as part of that, there has to be ongoing dialogue, but also ongoing accountability. Uh, it's got to be really um, woven into the fabric and the DNA of the company. And then I think it's not uncommon today that there are many companies that are also weaving this into their compensation program so that men and women leaders of the company are also being rewarded and compensated and had a, held accountable uh, for goals. And those goals, I would imagine, are going to be uh, changed and certainly adjusted over time. And uh, it really is a journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and it's not a zero-sum game. And it's not one of those, well, if I'm adding more diverse talent, the perception for some is, well, then I'm lowering the bar. You're not lowering the bar because there are extraordinarily talented men and women of color who have given the opportunity will be great contributors to your company. Um, I know that I benefited, uh, Norm and I, and our careers overlapped at, at Marriott, but, but I know, um, you know, for me, I had white, uh, five white male leaders at both Marriott and Hilton who took an interest in my career and it began as sort of coaching, uh, then moved to sort of mentoring and then ultimately became huge sponsors for me, and they're people, candidly, they're part of my kitchen cabinet and those that are still living. Uh, a few have uh, passed, unfortunately, um, but I still talk with those that are living. They're still in my kitchen cabinet. I still reach out to them. They're dear friends and uh, and have been an integral part of uh, what little success I've had. So I, I think once you get the foundation, there's the ongoing maintenance, and that becomes so important as you move forward. Yep. Yeah. Colette, will you answer? And then I believe Jim is back on and he'll- Thank you, Sandra. Yes, I am. Go ahead, Colette. <laughs> Welcome back, Jim. Um, you know, Norman Tom again hit so many really good points. I think what I would add to that is the comfort that people of color will have being a part of the Duke organization or any organization, um, even with all of the intent and the efforts behind it, that comfort comes from having a culture that is open and engaged and openly supportive of the diversity of its talent and diversity of its workforce. Um, it is a culture that acknowledges that it is important to be anti-racist, not just not racist. Um, it is a, an environment where there's an open dialogue about the challenges and opportunities that everybody has. You know, it's just because you're black or brown doesn't mean that some of the other challenges that exist in the workforce don't apply to you or they apply to you differently. Your experience and outtake of them may be influenced by that, but it's a holistic approach to having an environment where people feel supported, acknowledged, seen, um, and given the same opportunities to advance and grow and develop as everyone else does, and then having access to some of those additional resources that may be necessary. Uh, transitions or you know, jumping into a space where at least right now, you won't find yourself in an equitable percentage or an e a parity role of uh, being you know, one of a number of black or brown people or Asian people in the organization, you'll still feel a bit isolated. So understanding that isolation and helping to bridge that isolation um, as you build up that workforce that reflects the, you know, the makeup of the rest of the country and a percentage basis, if that's your goal, is going to be really important. And at some point, it'll even itself out. And that the comfort of seeing people in leadership and in middle management and in entry level roles and walking into that will be a much more comfortable space. But until we get to that point, um, we have to acknowledge that there may be a little extra support needed. There may be some more uh, resources that need to be made available to everyone, but in acknowledgement of the unique spot that people of color may have in the firm. 
Well, thanks. My next question is, is kind of a fun one, and I like to mix it up a little bit. If you were Jim Connor for a day, what's the first thing you do? And Jim, I, uh, I think that you've done most of what I would do. You, you've built uh, a great team. Uh, the, the, the Duke executive team is second to none, uh, all very capable executives who work well with one another, respect one another, and uh, I don't think as, as a group there's nothing that can be accomplished by that team. Uh, you, you've established meaningful performance goals uh, of that executive team and the company. Uh, you've gone through a process of, of refreshing the board, and, and uh, we've all been on, on – great boards and not so great boards and and uh our board is second to none there there's a collegiality uh respect for everyone's opinion uh it, it's it's a good meaningful dialogue that occurs at every every meeting and, and also you've taken what i think are, are really bold stances on on diversity uh and inclusion so so you you've done everything that i i'd say i would do i think sort of the next phase is, as we, we we move along if you if you look in terms of really important corporate goals and initiatives, whether it's a sales goal or development goal or what have you, uh, they're all tied to executive compensation. They're hard goals. And, you know, typically you'll see diversity goals that are a little more uh, squishy, if you will. And uh, and I think that sort of the next step is, is, is us getting even more serious about the serious work that we do in terms of diversity uh, and inclusion and, 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 and coming up with some hard goals. And, uh, and, and if we tie it to comp, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we'll, we'll meet and exceed uh, those expectations. Tom, your thoughts? Yeah, I, again, I, I think Norm hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's, a, it's a delicate conversation, Jim, but some companies um, have the kind of foundation and leadership that you've demonstrated at Duke are step and they're they're adding really firm goals and commitments uh, as part of the MBOs and part of the annual plan and some are even adding uh, DNI as a modifier as part of the long term the LTI compensation so you know you got to find the right balance it again is a journey and uh, it's a, it's a marathon not a sprint so you have to find that rhythm and where you and the board and the management team are but I think when you measure it and you make real goals and people are going to be compensated and rewarded and held accountable, you will get to that point as you and your team have done at every stage. Uh, regarding other advice, Jim, given your track record, your stock performance, and where your business model is right now, <laughs> um, I, will, I will keep my mouth shut since Norm and I happen to be in lodging, and we're just trying to weather the storm, and we're trying to get demand. And it'll come back at some point. Sure. Colette, what would you do? Well, given that uh, Tom and Norm have told you that setting the metrics, you know, you can't accomplish what you can't measure. The only thing I would add is something to consider is to reach out in the regional offices that have a presence in many of the major markets and say, Get, you know what we've done. You know what we need to do. What are the two new initiatives that you think you can execute in your region to improve our access to talent and our ability to attract and retain and build a presence throughout, you know, throughout the economy, um, supportive of our DNI interests as a firm, and take that on the ground insight of what you can do in Atlanta, what can you do in Florida, what can you do in Chicago that is additive and can be concretely uh, measured as an outcome to further your engagement with the effort. Because um, I think the rest of it is really very, very obvious, but there are, there are things that can be added to your arsenal um, of efforts. And I think it needs to be owned and executed on the regional level, and I think they need to buy into it. And so I would ask everybody to give me their thoughts on what they want to do and how they see that impacting the overall you know, firm's efforts here. Great. Uh, I'm going to shift it up. One of the things that we've heard um, from companies recently is uh, you know, their efforts in the communities 
um, with supplier diversity and things of that nature. We've had a supplier diversity program in place for 16 years. Our annual spend with our diverse flyers ranges between six and 10%. And for us, that's about 50 to $85 million a year, um, which is in many instances substantial, but at six to 10% doesn't seem um, you know, like it's um, you know, significant enough. Any ideas, thoughts, programs that you guys would have that you could share with the group that we ought to think about to bolster our supplier diversity program. Um, what, what, what one of you know we 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 acquire buildings and build buildings for a for a living, uh, and you know a number of years ago we, we had some pretty firm uh, minority supplier construction goals and and uh, you know we were on the hook because we had received a. a pretty significant subsidy from the city and the city said, hey, hit these numbers or there's going to be recourse associated with this uh, subsidy. And we went to the general contractor and they said, hey, we're not sure we can get there. And I say, you guys better get creative. We're, we're going to need to get there because we're not we're on the hook here. And and what we did is we cast a, a really wide net and, and we got a bunch of vendors and suppliers who, you know, may have had experience in you know, doing, say, drywall for multifamily, but they didn't have hospitality experience. So they were, you know, immediately eliminated. So a part of this big project, a year before we actually went vertical, we had to build, you know, several model rooms to make sure everything fit. So what we decided to do was every phase of those model rooms, those five model rooms we built, 100% uh, uh, minority suppliers. So flooring, plumbing, electrical. So by the time those model rooms were finished, we had this cadre of diverse suppliers who were absolutely experienced in lodging. Now, they may have only built five rooms, but they had experience. And we were able to place them on the job, uh, and, 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 and everything went swimmingly. The other thing that we, we, we did a, a good job of, we've done this uh, many times, is we'll take a large contract, whether it's concrete or drywall or, or what have you, and, and we'll break it into smaller pieces. So you, you may not be able to take a, you know, a, a, a $15 million job, but you can certainly perform against a $5 million job. So now it's a little more work on the project management side to manage three vendors as opposed to one, but it didn't really have a material impact on the contract price. Uh, so we've done a lot of that, and that helps to build capacity and, uh, and, and has yielded us great results. So just a couple of things that we've done. Great. Colette, your thoughts? Um some, you know, there is a struggle, you know, everywhere around identifying um, black and brown owned businesses um, in, in the construction trades or the supplier routes. And an interesting program that Turner Construction launched, I think, actually 15 or 20 years ago, a built to intentionally help develop um, some of the skill sets that smaller industry related suppliers and vendors needed in order to be able to effectively compete or to take on jobs, I think has actually helped them um, cultivate a cohort of resources of minority owned businesses that has been quite beneficial to their efforts to expand their engagement with uh, diverse contractors or diverse suppliers of product. That and then I think there is also the opportunity to look into cities um, that have very strong, you know, very large or significant uh, minority populations to just look at the range of businesses that are there and try to look at some that maybe you take under your wing to help grow. Uh, that is part of, I think, an, an interesting economic equity effort that would be both beneficial to the overall economy, but also could help Duke expand its resources and ability to um, build more capacity within those firms. Right. Tom, any, any additional perspectives? Yeah, I agree with both of those great concepts and, uh, and ideas. Uh, a couple things, Jim, that I would share. Um, uh, first, again, it begins with owner commitment. And I think Norm touched on this in his comments of saying, we've got an obligation, we're going to meet this. 
Um, this is something that's also near and dear to, to my heart. We had a lot of success with this at RLJ, and we've continued that at, at Park. Um, a couple of things that we've done, and I give credit to Carl Mayfield, who heads uh, the EVP of construction and, and design at uh, my former company, and a few years later, he was able to join me at, at Park. Um, he's of color, uh, extraordinarily uh, talented, 30 years of experience. He had worked for Park Construction. Uh, he too had not been in lodging prior to joining me the first time, and now he's got you know 15, 20 years in the lodging sector and a great, great track record. He came up with an idea to set up sort of a vendor day, and as part of that vendor day, he brought both uh, primes and subs, including minority aspiring and those that are already in the business, and use it as an opportunity to one have working sessions, um, have best practices and also lessons learned. And that pro provided a little bit of an ecosystem. We then were able to take that concept and, and match up sort of a mentor-mentee relationships that allowed us to help grow and develop uh, a next generation of, of these minority vendors. Uh, many of them have gone on to do extraordinarily well. We've also been pushing through the American Maternal Logic Association and our peers to broaden this concept so that we're building this pipeline. We all hear the, the excuse that we can't find them, they're not there, but again, if we invest in them with these types of programs, uh, and, and it's worked really well for us, and I know some of our peers are doing something similar as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for those those ideas. Um, when I, when I opened up the questions to all of our associate, one that continually came through from many, many different peoples, um, follows the first program that we did. Um, and it, it was asking if each of you had a story or an experience that you might be willing to share with the group to help us better understand the perspective of black people in business today. So uh, I know those are, those are personal and sometimes hard stories to tell, but if you had one that you thought would be applicable that we could learn from, I think that would be very helpful. Tom? Yeah, you know, Jim, I, I probably got so many in the vault here um, to, to sort of share. Um, but I, I, I think back to, to me, um, there were a couple of, of mentors early in my career. Um, and I think about a gentleman who's subsequently passed and um, he was extraordinarily difficult, challenging, uh, but he treated everybody uh, that way. Um, and he, and I appreciate it because he never singled me out because I was a person of color. He worked six days a week. Um, he came in every sort of Saturday morning as he was organizing. That was his day to kind of summarize the, the operating performance for that week. And I made it my business to come in early on Saturday mornings to help assemble the documents, prepare. This is early in my career. Um, he then continued um, uh, to support me and in between my first and second years of business school um, as uh, Warren and uh, Warren Thompson uh, and Norm know, um, kept me on the payroll between my sort of first and second years of business school, which at that time was a poor graduate student was really a game changer for me. But what I appreciated um, about that is, you know, as you're entering business and you may not have had, I didn't have members of my family who were in business at the point the call I was making, we just don't, you know, we didn't have that framework. Um, he refused to allow me to think of myself any differently than anybody else. And so I have always appreciated, and I think this applies to many people of color, you just, you just want the opportunity. You want the opportunity to develop your skill set. You want the opportunity to be held accountable for your performance. Uh, and even when others may have had a different pro a different approach or a problem with that, this gentleman never allowed, and I, I am to this day grateful, and this is north of 30 years ago, but it had a profound impact on the importance of preparation, of education of preparing, of not using excuses. And it was sort of a reverse because you you always sometimes wear that badge of, I'm the only person of color, it's gonna be a different, could be a different set of rules. 
and he refused to allow anybody else to think that even in even in my own mindset at that early in my career and that provided a great um, foundation for me as I was uh, as I was coming up through the ranks. Um, Colette, how about you? Well, uh, you know, as Tom said, there are a lot of them out there. Um, yeah. I would say that for me, being in this industry as a black female has had some really interesting um, challenges to overcome. I mean, I started my career in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, as an African-American female, I was the only African-American female in my office. I was the only one anywhere to be seen in the industry. And I'm in the South. And I, you know, for all that Atlanta thinks it is, it's still the South. And when I started, it was truly a, an industry engagement that was totally dominated by white older men. Um, I have had my entire career um, influenced by the fact that I am often the only African-American female in the room, be it within the company or outside. And that has forced me to figure out uh, someone on my own, because given that most of the other people I worked with were white males, um, their comfort with mentoring me in my career was not very good. Um, so trying to find my way on my own without trashing my career along the way um, was definitely a series of one step forward, one step back occasionally. And that was, un that was just outrageously frustrating. Um, I am fortunate that at some point I was able to build a community of support and of colleagues in the industry to help me better maneuver it. But stepping into this industry, and I would say, and maybe even more, especially in the industrial sector that you're dealing with, Jim, um, as a black female can be incredibly lonely. And that loneliness um, is a great opportunity to either thrive and figure it out or just totally disengage and walk away disappointed and disheartened. And I'm fortunate that I found that group that kept me um, focused on doing, doing the best I could and becoming as strong a performer and contributor as I could be um, in order to just hang in there. And I think that there are many um, people of color and especially women of color in this industry who have struggled with how to find your place how to be seen, how to be perceived as being as smart as everybody else, not being mistaken for the secretary in the crowd, um, and be given the opportunity to excel. Thank you. Norm? Uh, yeah, so I, I would begin by saying that, you know, black people want the same thing out of a career that everyone else wants. You know, they, they, they want an environment that is welcoming, a, a great workplace where everybody feels comfortable and where everybody is given an opportunity to compete, uh, plain and simple. In, in terms of stories, I, I, I've got a bunch and, and, and uh, some of them are, are heartfelt, but, but this one is, is a little funny in, in that uh, I, I had a meeting with uh, a number of city officials, as a mayor, as a city manager, and I went down there with my boss, who was a brilliant man. He recently passed, Tom knew him well, and he was sort of a bull in the china shop and, and Bill Marriott, and we were pitching on a, on a large project uh, in this city, and, and uh, I presented my piece, which the Marriott presented, and, my, and then my, my boss sort of took over the, the discussion, and, you know, we, we made our pitch, and so we're riding back in the car, and my boss, as he typically would, is, hey, I'll, I'll get back with, with the mayor and the city manager, and we'll, we'll get this thing buttoned up, and it's fine. And so he placed one call, then he placed another call, and a week passed by, and the, the mayor and the city manager actually called me direct three days later because I had a relationship with them. They happened to be African American. Uh, I knew them. They knew me. We knew, you know, some people in the same circle. And uh, no sooner than in a, you know, a week or two passed, Bill Merritt said, well, Norm Jenkins is going to be point on that project. And, you know, and that was sort of the power of diversity. People think in terms of this is a nice to do, but we won projects, multi-million dollar projects, because we had diversity initiatives in place, uh, because we were able to put people in the room who knew other people who, who could make decisions. So, so it's, it's a great thing. It makes everybody feel well. But 
diversity initiatives are creative to the bottom line. And, and that's, that's, that's another reason we do them. It, it is a business imperative. So that, that's, that's my story. Hey, hey Jim, if I could, if I could jump in, cause I think, I think Norm just hit on a really important point. It's, it's fascinating. If, if you look at, um, your two current directors, and then if you look at me for a second, and perhaps your listeners will, will appreciate this. Um, when I left, uh, when Warren Thompson left Marriott, uh, because of the credibility and because of the, the relationships that he had, um, he was able to buy a, a portfolio of restaurants to launch his business with the support and blessing of um, Bill Marriott, the Marriott family, and he was a senior executive at the time to launch what's now been a very successful business over a, you know, approximately a 30-year period. But again, having had that relationship and that support allowed him then to take that, that skill set and then ultimately become uh, a Marriott franchisee and, of course, go on to do his own thing and do it successfully. When I left Marriott to join Hilton and was at Hilton for, for several years, and when Hilton bought a uh, a hotel chain, and they inherited 17 hotels that they wanted to franchise and manage but not own, again, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, and given the fact that I had worked for both the CEO uh, and CFO when I had known them back, they both had been at Marriott as well. They allowed me to keep my day job for a year, my young family, to launch RLJ with Bob Johnson. Um, and I stay on the payroll for a year to launch a business. I can given the relationships, the credibility. I had to raise my own financing. Uh, we had to pay market price, a fairness opinion. The board also was supportive. You know, the rest is history. Norm, when Norm, again, a senior executive at Marriott, and again, one of the projects that Norm was talking about, that provided the foundation for Norm with the support of Marriott to then launch his business. Now you have you know, three African Americans that in real estate and as a result have done done pretty well for themselves. There are lots of stories like that. I think these are three pretty profound when you think about our own individual journeys. Um, we were um, friends, colleagues, and knew each other. Norm and I particularly overlapped uh, quite a bit uh, several years at Marriott and obviously remained obviously in the hotel business. But those are just examples of of building that ecosystem, that support system. Um, there is another generation coming up behind us, uh, and there are just lots of examples like that. Now, I'm not saying that Duke wants to take executives and put them in business at this point, but there's a natural season for everything. And in those seasons, we performed, we excelled at those companies, and then we've continued to grow separate businesses, but we're still tied into those business. I'm now, Hilton's largest franchisee, I'm a large Marriott franchisee and Hyatt, and, and so is Norm. So it, these are just interesting observations um, and three stories that are obviously tied directly into Duke. There are tons, and, I, and I, I speak on this often, as I know Norm and Colette, there are extraordinarily talented people that are only an opportunity away. Um, we were lucky and fortunate, um, and I think if there's any – lasting you know, message here is that continue to provide that tone at the top, that leadership, but also be that portal to bring in that next generation of leaders at, uh, at Duke. It will be one of the one plus one that equals three or five or ten, whatever it will be. Diversity is a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. Well, I, I appreciate all of you sharing those stories. You know, I, I, I have heard several of those from my time with you and, and Norm. Um, and, uh, you know, Marriott has obviously been a great contributor to diversity inclusion efforts for many, many years. And uh, let's just say I, I hope we can emulate what Marriott and Bill Marriott has done. Um, we are just about at the top of the hour, and I want to be very respectful of everybody's time. So I will just make a couple of closing comments. First, I, I want to thank all three of our panelists. I, I appreciate um, not only their thoughtful insights uh, on this very um, you know, sensitive topic in many of these areas. But, you know, these conversations will be a dialogue uh, that will be the foundation for change. And it's the kind of change that will help us all improve the world we limit, live in and eliminate racial and social injustice. You know, our investors today, uh, and Tom knows this and Colette and Norm know this as well, 
require companies that make profits, but as well as have a social purpose. Diversity inclusion has long been a part of the fabric at Duke Realty uh, and one of our many social purposes, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We've got to strive to continue to be better as evidenced by the hour we've all invested in this program today. We're considered a leader in the real estate sector, but I think we all want to be a leader in all sectors. So Colette, Norm, and Tom, I want to thank you again. And behalf of, on behalf of all of my colleagues at Duke Realty, uh, we're going to make a $1,000 donation in each of your names to your you. favorite uh, charitable uh, contributions. So again, thank the panelists and thank everybody for their time today.